Hey, I'm Julie Rose. Welcome to Love What You Love. I'm an author, creator, and enthusiast, and I've always been fascinated by the things that people are super into because they're always a unique expression of curiosity and joy and wonder. So every week, I'll introduce you to another fascinating human who's into really interesting stuff. Welcome back, or welcome. Right out of the gate, I have to say a huge thank you to Slow Lions, Amber Mom 1975, and Katriana Games. Reading your reviews on Apple Podcasts this week made such a huge difference. I mean, yes, rating and reviewing helps other folks find the podcast, but oh my gosh, I mean, you guys know what the world is like. These reviews 100% revived my flagging spirit. So thank you, truly thank you. Speaking of reviving a flagging spirit, let's meet this week's guest. Kelly Reynolds has a BA in music and a master's in French horn performance and has been performing for almost 20 years. She's absolutely passionate about music, playing it, listening to it, and getting kids excited about it. In this conversation recorded back in June, we talk about her French horn origin story, the origin story of the French horn, performing during COVID, arts education, and so much more. So find out why Kelly loves the French horn and why you might learn to love it too. Hello, Kelly. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. I am very excited to talk with you. You've got a BA in music from Cal Poly and a master's of music from UC Santa Barbara in the French horn. You've been performing for over 18 years. So I'm really interested to know why the French horn? What, what, what is it about the French horn that, that got you excited and has you performing and getting degrees in music? Um, it's funny because I, as a kid, I didn't start out thinking, well, this is my favorite instrument and Mm -hmm. that's what I want to play. I think as a kid, um, I wanted to play a lot of instruments and I was motivated by just that and wanting to, um, learn a lot of instruments. So, um, when I was in sixth grade, um, I said, I want to be in the orchestra. I want to play the violin. And so my parents, got me a, a violin and I played in the, you know, the elementary orchestra and I enjoyed it. Meanwhile, I said, I also want to play piano. So I played the piano and then um, went to middle school. And in seventh grade, they said, we have a band and who would like to join the band? And I said, well, me, <laughs> I want to play all the instruments. First of all, I said, I said to my mom, okay, mom, I want to play the flute. My mom said, Kelly, you, I, we, you're playing piano, you're playing violin, you're doing fine. If you want to play flute, if they have a flute, you can go play the flute. So I show up and I said, okay, do you have a flute? I'd like to play the flute. And they said, no, but here's a French. <laughs> and, they, and I went home with this big horn and my mom says, that is not a flute. <laughs> so, so that's how I started to play the, the French horn. I don't know. I just loved the sound of it. I didn't know then how how much I would love the sound of the French horn and and that it is in in all the most beautiful parts of any musical piece. And I mean, this is totally an opinion, and, and I'm sure I disagree. And of course, I have so much appreciation for all the other instruments, but I definitely have a bias towards the horn and. And in any movie that we're in a part that's emotional or um, exciting, it's a French horn. And it's just it's just a really special sound. It can be somber. It can be uplifting. It can be heroic. And and I'm lucky to play it. 
or try anyways. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I have so many questions. So why did you want to play all the instruments? Like, where did that come from? What, what was that impulse? Did you grow up in a really musical family? Like, what was that about? No, um, I had a teacher and she, she could play so many instruments. She played violin and she could play the piano and she plays the hammer dulcimer, just a lot of different wonderful instruments. And I, I just always, and then she'd sing and I just thought that was so cool. I wanted to. I want to do that too. (laughs) And not specifically those, but I wanted to be able to play a lot. It's funny now because that's not the case for me at all. I think I've lost my piano knowledge. I mean, I can uh, plunk a little. We had to do it in college and then I could help my kids with their piano lessons. But yes, it was a teacher. It's always a, a teacher in your life that is inspirational in some way and in different ways, especially my French horn private teachers. They, um, they have held the, some of the dearest spots in my heart, um, throughout my life. So teachers can be, of course, very inspirational. What was it about playing and music that made you want to get degrees in it and, and an, an advanced degree in it? And then what goes into getting an advanced degree in music? I, I look back and I often think, gosh, what, yeah, what led me down this, that path or what, what were my original intents when I set out to, to be an adult in this world? Mm -hmm. And and, um, I think that I was always really involved with music. I was in the marching band. I was in the, the pit orchestra and all the theater productions. And, and then also in high school, we traveled and, and, um, with my band in Texas, we went to New York and played in Carnegie Hall. And a lot of that was so inspirational to me and so powerful and like the best moments of my life and the camaraderie with people. So when you're thinking about, when I was thinking about going to college, I just, that's what I wanted to do. And I, when you are, when you're applying to be a music major, you have to go for auditions. And in some cases, like at UCLA, they, they have you do a theory and musicianship test at the same time. And I was clueless. I hadn't done any of that before going to college. So UCLA was a very stressful experience and realize at that time what went into a music major. Going to Cal Poly, it just felt like home where I'm analytical in a lot of ways and I'm an overthinker and all of those things. When I made that decision, I'm not sure that I um, I thought about it so much as I just kind of followed my heart. And that's um, I think that's why I wanted to be a music major, first of all, and then why um, I chose that place. Cal Poly was wonderful. It was a small program and um, other universities where if you're studying music, you'll probably get a a bachelor of music and it's more um, performance oriented. And at Cal Poly, it was um, a lot of history and, you know, we did the theory and musicianship and all of those things. Um, And, um, but also a lot of performance because it was small. I played in every group. So I'd start 8 a.m. with theory and end at 10 p.m. playing in the wind orchestra there. So it was, there were long days and, and wonderful people, wonderful teachers, wonderful friends. And then, um, you come to the end of that and you have a choice. And when you're a music major of what do I do now? And, and, and do I continue and get a credential and be a music teacher? Or do I want to try to be a performer? For me, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know why I didn't pursue being a teacher, except I was just excited to keep playing and to keep learning about the horn. And to I wanted to do the master's degree. And I tried for UCLA again, and got in there and UCSB, I tried two places, I got into both. But I, again, it was a, a feeling and I was excited about my teacher at UCSB. And also, it was a smaller program there as well. And I think I was just drawn to that because of the way that Cal Poly was, it would just felt like a family. And then what, and then that was about, uh, sorry, a master's in music, um, MM, and there's a lot more research and writing. And also the, the classes that I chose, I've always been interested in history of music. And um, so I'd sort of choose an ethnomusicology kind of music of the world. So I would choose a lot of those type of classes. I'm not as much drawn to theory, though it is important. 
And then musicianship, you have to do more of that. That's ear training. So when you uh, when you got to your master's program and, and part of it was research, was there a specific uh, historical era that you researched or, you know, a theory that you got deep into? Kind of what was your focus uh, in your master's program? Well, the focus of my master's was um, French horn performance at that point. I was also a, a graduate assistant there. And so a lot of my duties were I would run the incoming, the the freshman undergrads in their French horn studio. And so um, teaching privately, running a group of horn, um, horn players, that was, that was my main task. But um, I was also really interested in where, you know, where things come from, kind of the ancestry of an instrument. I took this one class, it was, um, organology and it was the classification of musical instruments and how how would you class how would you organize them within a like a museum it was really cool because it was there was only like maybe six of us sitting around a table inside this great collection of historical musical instruments and um what she did for one of these projects is she just set down an instrument in front of us and said you have to tell me everything about this instrument. And I, t- I'm all you know is what's in front of you. In my case, I, I was given um, like a sheep's horn, but it had art on it. So I ended up in the art library because of the art on it. Oh, I love that. That sounds so interesting. So it's like anthropology and art and music kind of all at one. Yes. I, I love that kind of thing where, you know, multiple subjects kind of cross over and um, you're just learning about the past. and I love it. So speaking kind of of the past, when did the French horn kind of, when was it developed? And then what era of music is it most prominent in? It's not really from horns. <laughs> it's So a lot of times we'll just call it a horn and people will, will say, well, what kind of horn? Ah, oh, French horn. You know, so um, it is from, you know, it's a European instrument and um it derives from, you know, if, if back in, you know, hundreds of years ago, they didn't have cell phones. So um, they use like a ram's horn or, um, you know, sheep's horn to to blow on to send us a, a signal. Hey, I'll be home at five, you know, <laughs> or hey, dinner's ready. <laughs> or and those, you know, then turn into like a, a, these metal hunting horns that you see in a lot of pictures of hunting expeditions or whatever. And they they would send calls, you know, but up, but uh, I hear a rabbit, or <laughs> I don't know what they were saying, but even for hunting, right? And so, um, eventually those were um curved so they could send the message backwards. So then, uh, 1600, oh gosh, don't quote me. So, um, they wanted to use the sound of the, the hunting horn and the, um, that pastoral element in, in an opera. I think that was in France. And so that was the first time I was like in, in an orchestra. They're like, Hey, this works. So let's, let's use this and, um, in, in more pieces. So originally it was just one tube curved. It's conical. So meaning it's tapered. So at the, the top, it's thinner where it, is at, at the mouth, you know, the, and then, and then it gets bigger as it goes on. Other instruments can be cylindrical where they're just one size most of the way, like a trumpet is cylindrical. Trombone is cylindrical. Um, but a French horn and I, I think a tuba, they're conical instruments. So the flare of the horn bell became interesting because there, there weren't originally valves on the horn. There weren't, you know, keys. So people used their hands to change notes. So if you cover the inside of the bell, it'll make it more flat. So it it makes it lower. And then as you open, it makes it higher. You can play different notes just using the hand. They discovered that. And then, so for a long time, these horns, we call them now natural horns and people still play them today. They were used in orchestras. and, and, And so a lot of repertoire is written for the horn, the horn parts are written for the notes that you can play on just on the horn as just by moving your lips. So when you're playing a brass instrument, you are not, you know, putting down keys like you would on a, a flute or a clarinet. You are you are changing the, the pitch by changing the size of your the, the 
that your embouchure, the the hole in your lips as you're buzzing. Oh. And, yeah, and the sound is made by the buzzing of the lips, the, you know, <laughs> the raspberry. Yeah. <laughs> make it babies but then that size of that when you change it it changes the notes on the instrument so that changes the notes but then also um on the on the horn you can also as you're playing um one pitch you can change um it to be lower with your hand um eventually that okay so if you have one length of tubing um you're going to be in one key so if you're if you want to change the key, that's kind of hard. So in some pieces, early pieces, the horn will just bow out at some point mm. because they modulated to another key. Well, the horn can't modulate because it's pitched in one key. So eventually they they asked, started adding piping that you could um, take out and and then grab a bigger one or grab a smaller one. So you could change the key of the instrument and also they would have two horns pitched with in one key and two horns in another key so in a lot of um mozart say you'll you'll have four horns but it'll be two in one key and two in another key and that went on even even through beethoven you see a lot of that so through the 1800s eventually well how did how, this is kind of cumbersome to carry around all the different slides and um so Let's put it all in one horn. So then that's when you start seeing what the valves and what the valves do is they send the air down different length pipes. And then that helps you you play those notes. Um, and then now we even have rows of valves where you can you can send them in all different which ways. So it makes the it also makes the this the sound better than if you're covering your bell, because that when you cover your bell, it makes kind of a brassier or a more closed off sound as you would imagine because you're closing it off it has a better tone quality when you can play you know all the notes in a row just on you know with open with an open but that's why we have to have our hands in the bell because that is changing the pitch of things so as we're playing with with people and you need to change your um, pitch depending on the note you can cover or open depending on where you're you're falling or how it's feeling and you you go because you want to play in tune with other people. What's your favorite piece of music that features a French horn? I think Strauss, Richard Strauss is one of the best. I, he has two horn concerti and um, they are amazing. And they're they're kind of the go-to for, especially his first concerto um, is kind of the go-to for a lot of um, French horn players for um, showmanship and I, I love Dvorak and I mean, the New World Symphony is, is, is it, that's, has, I don't know, it's the most, one of the most beautiful duets in the second movement. I mean, there's so many. <laughs> <laughs> so, so do you, when, when you were doing your masters, did you have like a performance recital that you had to do at the end? Yes. And so what did you perform for that? We had recitals as well that we could participate in that were um, in the department wide and you could sign up to be a part of a recital. So you, you had, there were plenty of opportunities to practice performing. Um, and then at the end of my junior year, I did a joint recital with my best friend. She's a cellist. She and I shared one. So that was great, at, you know, as juniors to be able to practice doing that. And then at the end of my senior year, you have a senior recital um, and different because we were a Bachelor of Arts, different people had different options. Some people did education projects if they were going to be a teacher or some wrote papers. Mine was a recital. My senior year, I did um, unaccompanied solo piece by Freudus Werk. And um, that that was cool. I, I was playing in a church and played it from the balcony and people sat down and there's nobody in front of them. And I, I stood up in the top and just started playing. And that was cool. <gasps> Oh and, my gosh. <laughs> That's dramatic. I love that. And then um what else? I think I played a Mozart, a Mozart concerto. Those are great. The coolest piece I played on that recital was written by my um one of my professors, Craig Russell. He wrote this horn rhapsody for Richard Todd, um, who's a famous horn soloist. So that was really special. I still I think I'm the only one that's ever played it that that and I have it here at home. <laughs> oh, and then and like and then I had two masters recitals and some Strauss.
So what is it about performing with other people? Like what what does it do for you and why is it different for an audience? Playing with other people is is the best. It's just you're working on something that's so powerful. I mean, I and I and I know that that sometimes when you're in an audience it's just a maybe maybe it's not your jam or something, but but sometimes it is because everything is so different. I mean, when we talk about classical music, it's there's I mean, we're talking of hundreds of years and of and, and so there's so much music that that to say, you know, I don't love classical music. Would it? Well, have you listened to it all? <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot to choose from. But there's something about being in it that is so fun. And 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 even though sometimes, you know, we don't have we don't have like the closest relationships with every single person in an orchestra, of course, but, but you definitely bond over, over working on something that has historic history um, and emotional power and um, is so challenging. Sometimes um, this music is just really hard and you think you start playing it. You think, oh, gosh, are, are we going to be able to do this? <laughs> Am I going to be able to do this? And I, I think that all the time, every time we try something new and I start playing, I think, ah, oh, I hope I, I have to work really hard on this. But when then when you, you know, you work hard, you, you overcome frustration. I mean, there's so much frustration that happens when you're working on pieces and whether it's your own, it's usually mostly my own or trying to sync up with other people you sometimes you hit a hit a wall or you're trying to go i always tell my students you know if you're struggling it means you're about to learn something mm-hmm. and and you're about to get better it's you're almost there when it's your your most difficult moment and i think that's a good analogy for life as well when you when you do that with other people there's something about it and everyone at the end is like yay we did it you know like <laughs> that was great and and not the audience probably won't totally understand what you just went through to do that to accomplish something like a good performance or even you know even if you honk notes you always honk notes you always mess up somewhere (laughs) and I mean that's also the beauty of live music is is just getting through it if you mess up you keep going you don't you don't stop and walk off the stage you keep going and try again and there's something about like learning and performing music that like it encompasses so many things right because it's like you have your analytical side where you have to like understand what the what the piece is doing, but then you have your emotional kind of creative side where you're just feeling into the music and then you have to work hard. It's like, do you feel like every kid should I don't know about be required, but be super encouraged to take up an instrument when they're young? Yes. Totally. I absolutely leave that. I mean I I, I'm so frustrated by every time you just see it so much in so many areas where every time something is cut, it's always music or, mm. or and maybe not always like, because someone pointed out, well, you know, art too. And gosh, these things that make us human, it's like, why is that the first thing to go? And it just, it breaks my heart. And I just feel like that should always be funded. And, and that, every kid should have the opportunity to play an instrument. I just think it would make people better humans. I mean, even if it's not your thing, at least you tried and, but maybe, maybe that instrument wasn't right. You know, it may be, and and, and it's okay. Like if, if, if it isn't everyone's thing, but I just feel like there would be a lot more appreciation for the, you know, the challenge that it presents and, and the, just the music in general, because, um, and there, there's a lot more than, um, you know, guitar and piano and singing. And, and there are so many instruments that are out there. And, and maybe, you know, those would, would suit people. But I, I think for kids, I, I just, I'm not a teacher, you know, and, and I didn't, I didn't go down that route, but I, but I am very, I, you can ask any of my friends. <laughs> I just think it's so important. I say, put your kid, get your kid an instrument and, and, and get them lessons and enroll them in the band and, and deal with the, the learning sounds. <laughs> it's so good for them. And if not, 
that they're the best musician in the world. They don't need to be at all. Um, they, if it, it, it's for the, the teamwork and the camaraderie and the, when you're reading music, you're learning a new language, you know, you're, you're learning how to, how to translate that into making it into a sound and, and to, and then when you're making the sound, you have to learn how to make it sound pretty and how, how to use it to be expressive and artistic. And so there's definitely, there have been many, you know, studies and that have proven that it's a great thing for your brain. And, um, but for many other reasons, I, I just feel like it's such a good thing for, for children and adults alike. Yeah. I was going to ask you about adults, you know, it's intimidating to, you know, start learning a language or start to your point music as a language when you're an adult. So do you have any kind of recommendations for, folks who listen to this podcast and get fired up and want to go out and, <laughs> I don't know, take up the guitar or take up the piano, like, what would you recommend? How to approach it? If you get a, a private teacher, and now um, you can do a lot online. I mean, you really can. And I know a lot of people learn things on YouTube. And I mean, it's it's not the same as having someone be able to, you know, position your hands in the right place and everything. But finding a teacher is helpful. And you can start you can you can play and that there are so many groups out there that I mean I've known people that have stopped playing and then started playing again and and we play together you know and 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 there are different levels of community groups or there were you know this COVID-19 has changed a lot and I I'm hopeful for the future I'm trying to be hopeful for the future but it's definitely you know playing in a big group is just I don't know when to happen again you know and it just kind of is sad but um do you do you do zoom like or webex or zoom calls with other musicians where you just just to get a fix yeah you can't really play together though because it's delayed but i have been um just a couple nights ago recorded with the we've been recording our individual parts um and then someone splices it all together so a few weeks ago the woodwinds from my the, the group that I play in in San Jose Cambrian Symphony, the woodwinds from that group, we put together, a, we each recorded our own parts. And then our clarinet player, he put together all of the parts into one. And then it's not the same as playing together, but at least we're playing. But I also wanted to say, go back to, you know, what people can can do music education for adults. I don't think it's limited to just playing an instrument, attending concerts or supporting musicians or just looking for something different than what you are used to listening to. Like if you say, I love just country music, you know, maybe try listening to something else and and not just classical music, um, any kind of other music. I, I just want to highly encourage just reaching out and trying other things. You know, YouTube, of course, has all sorts of stuff, but pretend somebody just has no idea where to start. Where would you point them uh, in their journey to find new music? I'm an Apple Music subscriber, and you can click on a genre of music. And so it, just clicking on it and then like maybe just having it in the background, which has its benefits as well, you know, and and then maybe something spikes your interest like, oh, that's cool. What was that? And then you look at what's playing. But even if you have it on in the background and you're not necessarily like, oh, I want to dance to this. <laughs> <laughs> Having the classical music on specifically does a variety of different things. Like it can incre- increase your productivity I, I, it, and, I don't know, calms you down or sparks creativity. I, just a different... It has different benefits than even just if you're actively listening. Well, this has been super eye-opening and enlightening. I will definitely include links to to a lot of the stuff we talked about, and I'll include some clips from some of the pieces you recommended. Um, But I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. This has been fantastic. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And I, I do hope that whether it's, you know, listening yourself or um, people who are who are listening to this podcast if you're listening or if you play an instrument keep going if you did played it in the past maybe pick it up again 
or if your kids are interested, support them and get them the resources they, they need. And if, and if you don't have the means to do it, then, then find it and, and support your school music programs in ways that will, will help encourage some of, some of that funding. Um, or if there's donations to make to local symphonies that are struggling right now. Yeah. To, I, it's, it's such a, a wonderful thing that our, that humanity has created. passion for music is so infectious, right? I've got a ton of links in the show notes to YouTube videos of different iconic French horn pieces and performances, curated by Kelly, of course. Check them out and let me know on Instagram at lovewhatyoulovepod or on Twitter at whatyoulovepod which ones were your favorites. The show notes also include links to Kelly's favorite nonprofits and to a rotating list of my own as well. Zeke Rodriguez Thomas at Mind Jam Media provided amazing editing assistance. You can find Zeke at mindjammedia.com. Also, huge thanks to Emily White for the episode transcripts, which are available to patrons at patreon.com slash lovewhatyoulovepod. And you know what I'm going to say. Be good to yourselves, be good to each other, and love the hell out of whatever it is that you love. Thanks for listening. Let's hang out again soon. There's some good in this world, Mr. Furl. And it's worth fighting for.